next, we have uh, another group of speakers. Uh, Samantha Springer, a conservator at the Portland Art Museum in Portland, Oregon. And Dario Gasparini, a structural engineer at Case Western Reserve University. And they will be speaking about the Cleveland Hill. Stella. Thank you, Jim. And thank you to all of the organizers um, for putting on this great forum. And um, I mentioned before, I worked here at the Cleveland um, Museum of Art for six years, so I had the pleasure of working with Dante and Philip. And um, so today I'll talk about one of the projects that um, I was a part of while I was here. So for those of you who have never been to the Cleveland Museum of Art before, it may be hard to imagine that only two years ago, um, they were finishing up an eight-year building project, and, which required the complete closure of its galleries for three years. So the project that I will share with you today took place during that eight-year period. Um, and I was really only one of a large, one member of a large team involving other conservators, curator, um, designers, registrars, art handlers, riggers, and a number of consultants. Um, and I participated in the second half of the project when I worked here um, and was lucky enough to see its completion before I moved to Portland. Um, so today I will give you a background for the project, why it was carried out, um, and the conservation investigation that went on. And then I'll hand it over to Dario Gasparini who will talk um, over about he will talk about his role in the project and the new mounting system that was designed. So the artwork um, at the center of this project is this Mayan stela. Um, it's a stone monument that originally stood over 12 feet high and 18 inches thick, dating from 692. And it came into the collection in 1967 in over 40 fragments, shortly after it was removed from its original site, El Peru in Guatemala. So did, to display the fragments in the 60s, staff set them into, a pla into plaster within a shallow five-sided aluminum box or tray, which was then built into a wall at the entry to the pre-Columbian galleries. And this is now an entry point to the early Italian Renaissance gallery. So hopefully you'll have a chance to see some of the um, galleries and exhibitions. So the stela remained in this location until 2005 when it needed to be moved for the renovation. And it's important to point out or to note that the sides of the box um, came out past the front of the artwork and also added six to eight inches around the perimeter, the sides and the top of, of the stela. So the monument would have originally been situated on a site such as this, standing in front of a temple and here you can see some um, tourists standing here and um, imagine this is um, the stela in front of the temple. Um, and it would have been a much larger piece of stone. So imagine a double 12 feet of stone and then another 12 feet possibly underground. Um, so it was embedded in the ground in order for it to stand upright. So the original, original stela was cut into rectangular pieces and then the front was sawed away in order to ease removal from the site. So in addition, this three foot section depicted here, um, depicting the head of a mythical creature is also missing from the bottom from what you see in the galleries today. So and here you can see what it would have looked like originally with that three foot section um, attached or still remaining underneath it. So the two curatorial goals for this project were to install the free stela as a freestanding monument rather than embedded in a wall where it looked more like a wall relief, um, removing as, and as removing as much of the um, 60s mount as possible, and then raising it to its original height. So visiting the museum as it stands today, um, moving the artwork may not, if you, if you are can mentally visualize some of the galleries, it may not seem too complicated of an endeavor. So you just get it out of the wall, roll it across the atrium, and then put it in the freight elevator and um, bring it up to the uh, pre-Columbian galleries. 
However, the atrium in the pre-Columbian galleries didn't exist at the time, so it was a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and in 2005, this is what happened instead. The walls around the stela were deconstructed, um, and then the stela inside of the aluminum box, which you can see the sides of the box here, um, were lifted with this tow motor, and I was not here at the time because I think I might have had a heart attack, um, but apparently at that time it was discovered that the steel weighed more than a ton, and in order to prevent the tow motor from tipping forward, these nice, kind gentlemen stepped onto the back of it. So to keep the art, then in order to keep the artwork upright for storage, um, this wooden framework was built, and you can see it was set on top of two dollies in order to ease movement around the building. Um, and the stela was moved to a temporary storage location on the second floor of a building that is now demolished um, until it was rolled to this opening in the building. You can see the bright sunlight in the background there. It was rolled to the opening, um, rolled onto this steel plank, and then lifted by crane through the air. Again, I'm glad I wasn't here for this moment. Um, set down onto a flatbed truck and slowly driven around Wade Oval. I think it was drizzling that day, so they covered everything with plastic, um, to enter a completed portion of the northeast corner of the building. So it was at this point that I became involved in the project and to achieve the goals for display um, established by the curatorial department, um, we had two primary objectives. First, to determine the structural stability of the existing mount and then second, to figure out how much of the existing mount we could, could be modified and minimized so that we could get from wall relief to freestanding monument. Unfortunately, we had very little information in the files about the mount and the mounting process, so yay for documentation. Um, so instead, we started the process of reverse engineering. So immediately from the back, that's what, this is the back of the aluminum box here, painted yellow. Um, we could see these two vertical braces or stiffeners, and there were also a couple dozen whole, couple dozen holes um, and the ends of 20 or so threaded rods secured with nuts and washers. And at this point, we really had no idea what any of those holes and rods were doing there. So through x-radiography, we discovered that there were actually also three additional horizontal stiffeners um, on the inside of the aluminum box. And now I'll show you a, a zoom in on this detail of the films highlighted in yellow. And so just to orient you, this is one of the vertical stiffeners or braces. And whoops, sorry. Um, these bright areas here are the um, threaded rods and washers and nuts. Um, and the x-ray revealed that these rods were actually um, bent into a hooked shape and then these dark lines here um, correspond with the holes that we saw from the back of the, of the, um, of the aluminum box. And the holes in the x-ray, um, they look slanted, but they're actually perpendicular to the surface, but they appear to be cockeyed because of the location of the x-ray tube when we took the images. Um, in addition, this fine chain link fence pattern was something we saw but we were not expecting, and Dario, thankfully, um, suggested that it was expanded metal lath used to reinforce the plaster, um, and that the hooked threaded rods were used to hold that lath in place, probably while the plaster was um, put in place. So one of the drawbacks of x-radiography is that all of the layers are flattened into one plane. So to better understand the stratigraphy and condition of the materials, we opened up two exploratory holes into the plaster. And so I'll just zoom in um, on this hole. And this is the painted surface of the front of the plaster. Um, 
underneath were several inches, underneath several inches of plaster was the expanded metal lag. So we had confirmation there of that material. Um, another half inch of plaster with rust stains from the lag, and then a gummy gray material, and finally the yellow paint on the inside of the aluminum tray. And here is the location of the window that we opened up on the back. And um, after cutting through the back plate with a rotary saw, um, this exposed plaster here, and then the lab, and finally the back of the stone you can just see peeking through the plaster. And what we found really surprising at this point was the softness of the plaster and how easily it came away from the stone. So to figure out how all of this information corresponded to each other, um, I spent some time overlaying all of the images that we had, the x-ray, oops, sorry, the x-rays and um, the frontal, the frontal images, um, and started marking all of the pieces of information that we have. And so you can see um, here is where the x-ray films were, where the cuts in the stone were, um, and where all of the, the green marks um, were the hooked uh, threaded rods and the pink marks, which is this most important here, are the holes on the back of the, um, of the aluminum box. And so here, just for clarity, um, I've converted the pink marks to black and show where all of the black lines show the cut marks of this in the stone. So what I've discovered was that for each of the fragment, largest fragments of the artwork, there were four holes in the back of the mount, one at each corner. So the holes were likely left behind by levelers um, to use to align each piece of stone with one another before it was embedded in plaster with everything in the horizontal position. And then those levelers were removed after, after the plaster had set, um, leaving those holes behind. And it took us a long time to get to this point where we realized the whole thing was put together horizontally and how all of the, um, how the mount actually worked together. And so now I will hand the mic over to Dario. Um, his work, and he worked with us throughout this whole assessment process and um, was instrumental in um, helping to create this new support system that he will talk about. Um. Well, thank you. I'm a structural engineer. I work at nearby Case Western Reserve University, and we were asked to determine whether we could remove uh, these side plates they did not want the Stella to be displayed as a, a frame in a box, so and we were asked to design a new cantilever support for the Stella. On the basis of that exploratory hole that uh, Samantha showed, uh, we were able to infer uh, the structure of the box. And basically, it had a quarter inch plate at the back, it had welded stiffeners, then it had welded. Uh, uh, angles and we were fortunate enough that the actual sides which were nine by a half inch side plates were bolted from the inside so we were confident that once we determined that the installation was actually stable uh, we could uh, and if we replace the function that was supplied by the side plates then we could remove these uh, side plates so that was our uh, our first uh, role to determine the role of the side plates. And basically, uh, they serve to stiffen the, the back plate. The top side plate stiffens it from bending in this direction, and the side plates uh, stiffen the back plate uh, from bending in this direction. So the first thing that we had to do is obviously uh, substitute for these two side plates some other stiffening system, and that's what we did. Uh, so we uh, uh, installed four vertical steel stiffeners and three horizontal uh, stiffeners to the back of the Stella. Um, before we did this, we protected the front of the Stella with a, a foam cushion 
make sure no pieces fell out and to make sure there was no damage to the system. Um, the only, there's nothing complicated about this. The only thing I want to point out is that uh, we did use stainless steel screws and we did use um, a 20 mil polymeric film between the aluminum and the steel. And the steel was primed and painted to inhibit and prevent uh, corrosion. Um, in addition, I want to point out that the reason we use four is because our frame had two columns, which were tubes that extended vertically, and these were the two bearing points, one here and one there, and the holes above it are holes for the L-shaped uh, lifting bracket that we designed. Basically, we just use conventional technology that is used by almost every structural engineer when a panel is to be hung on to a building. Typically, if you have pre-manufactured panels, uh, you support these panels by two vertical points in a static and determinant fashion, and then two other points at the bottom that uh, pr uh, can provide adjustments in uh, two horizontal axes. So these two bearing points, which were uh, bolts, could be adjusted to uh, uh, control the rotation about a um, axis perpendicular to the plane of the Stella, and these two bottom bolts could control the rotation about an axis in the plane of the Stella. So this is a very simple system that was, uh, that is used commonly to support uh, uh, panels on buildings. And we are fortunate to have these panels that here in the museum. Here's one of them. Uh, this is what you see when you walk outside on the east wing. Uh, you see a concrete panel with a very thin layer of uh, marble and granite. So, and these panels are hung uh, onto the steel frame of the building by almost exactly the same system that we use. Basically two bearing points at the top and two horizontally adjustable, uh, hor uh, only horizontal supports at the base. So this is exactly what we use for uh, our system. So this is the, uh, there was one problem and that is that the uh, conservation suite only admitted a certain height and the, uh, and the Stella, in terms of the display height, had to be taller. So uh, we had to first install the, uh, install the backing stiffeners and then move the entire Stella into a high bay of the museum in order to then uh, attach it to our basic frame that we designed with the height that was uh, required by the curator, uh, Sue Berg. Huh? So here it is being in the high bay. We did design two special L-shaped lifting uh, frames. We, didn't know, we did not know where the center of gravity was of the entire package. And so we designed two L-shaped lifting frames that were adjustable. So the pickup point had a plus or minus two inch horizontal position variability so that when we picked up the, the Stella, it would stay vertical rather than tilt over and complicate uh, the mating of the, uh, of the Stella to the frame. So we, that was a feature that was uh, useful. So once we lifted the uh, Stella, we adjusted the pickup point and uh, the Stella basically was vertical as we picked it up. I, my, uh, the person who fabricated the steel frame was Neil Harnar. He was our department engineer in the Department of Civil Engineering here at Case. He's now facilities manager for the Case School of Engineering, so he's been promoted. But he basically did all the fabrication of this frame. Uh, you can see that basically there are two posts. There are six by three by five sixteenth inch tubes, steel. And this is a, the welded frame that he welded together. The two challenges were uh, obviously to weld a completely flat, roughly six foot by six foot uh, floor plate. So he did this admirably. All when he, The first thing that he did after he completed the welding, he put on the casters and then he 
to verify that it moved uh, evenly on the floor. And in fact, there was really very little distortion in the base. The other thing that I want to point out is that these are the extenders. So the idea was that this is the height at which uh, the display in the gallery was to be uh, designed. But before that could be designed, we removed these extensions. They were about 19 inches to get it to the height where it would fit back into the, uh, into the um, uh, conservation laboratory. This is Shelley uh, Payne. She was the conservator who led uh, with Amanda uh, the, the conservation of this particular object. So now we were confident that we could make the base, the posts, and the, uh, and the Stella itself. So we basically, we had Carlo Maggiora, who's this gentleman, uh, cut off a portion of the bottom uh, base. We did not remove the entire bottom base because we, were, we wanted to for supporting some of the Stella. Uh, so we cut off about four or five inches of the uh, bottom plate, and then we lowered it again downward, and we uh, retransported it back into the conservation laboratory. So here it is in the conservation lab. So uh, the only thing we needed to do at this stage, uh, prior to the final conservation steps, was really remove the side plates. And that was rel done very relatively easily with hole, uh, we used a, a hole drill and uh, some ethanol as a, as a lubricant. And we removed all of the, uh, all of the uh, bolts that were at attaching the side plates, and then we simply removed the side plates. And then our work was basically done. We left the Stella in its position uh, for Samantha to do final uh, conservation on the stone. And then after a few months period, after the gallery was ready, uh, we transported it back into the gallery, lifted it up again, and then uh, on display. So this is this process of uh, uh, putting the uh, Stella in the proper display. You can see that the extensions have been put in. Uh, this, uh, and this step went well also. And this is the rolling it into the final position. I do want to, maybe not in this picture, but uh, there are four leveling screws. There are one here, one there. There's four leveling positions. So the weight of the Stella, which is when everything is combined, is over 3,400 pounds, I think. So it does not bear on the wheels. It bears on these leveling plates. So here it is uh, in the position that you would see it if you go into the proper gallery here on the, on, in the museum. Uh, One point that I want to make, it was meant to be installed as a, as a, as a cantilever, but um, this wall was uh, added in, uh, primarily to control light ingress into the gallery. So uh, that, that is why that wall exists. So this is it as you see it as you, when you visit the second floor. I just want to make a, a couple of comments. Uh, one is that we did not do any seismic analysis on this. I did not do any explicit dynamic analysis of this mount. Uh, Cleveland is not a very uh, highly seismically active area, but I think this design lends itself to uh, the frictional base isolation that was discussed by Christine. We could easily control uh, underneath the leveling mounts, we could put a controlled frictional layer and control the uh, really isolate this particular structure from the uh, movement of the uh, building during an earthquake. But again, Cleveland is not a very highly seismically active area, but if this were somehow to travel somewhere where, which was highly seismically active, we could put frictional layers underneath the four mounting uh, leveling mounts. Thank you very much for listening to me.